Good morning. It's great to be back with you. It's been an exciting couple of weeks. Uh, we're out to see uh, Aaron and Athena and uh, Sophia and Eliana in Cincinnati and then come home and have a day break before I went to national conference. And so it's uh, great to be back with you uh, this Sunday. Uh, you know, it's interesting. When I, I left, I think it was like 12 days without rain, and I think I hit like 15 or 16 days, and now we've been getting lots of rain, and so, so God is good. You know, some people that are having picnics and things, the, the, the rain may be hindering some of that, but you know, we can celebrate all that God does. I was watching this little bird out of my window, and it was just kind of fluttering its wings in the rain and, and, and just celebrating this rain after a dry season. And so we thank God for his goodness and grace and his daily provision that he gives to us. Uh, at National Conference, we elected the 15th bishop for the Evangelical Congregational Church. Uh, Randy Sizemore uh, won that ballot and will assume uh, the responsibilities of bishop for the next National Conference uh, towards uh, uh, Memorial Day next year. Uh, I know he will be leaving his church in April so that he has time uh, to kind of adjust with things so he and Bruce can work to help him be acclimated. And I think Randy will do a wonderful job. Uh, you want to be in prayer for Randy and Carla, his wife and family, and his church, and, uh, and for the, the EC Church family. I, I, I so appreciate all that uh, Bishop Bruce and Gloria have done for the, uh, the denomination and for the churches. They, they certainly have a heart for the Lord and a love for the Lord's people, and I know that Randy and Carla bring that into the mix as well. And so I'm excited to see how God will move in them as we move forward in faith. Uh, today is Trinity Sunday. And Trinity Sunday is the Sunday after uh, Pentecost. We celebrated the birth of the church last Sunday. And this Sunday, we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon God's church. Uh, we celebrate God as creator. God the Father as creator. God the Son as savior. And God the Holy Spirit as comforter. And so the triune God who gives us all that we need, life and life abundant. And so praise God uh, for this uh, Trinity Sunday that we have. Uh, it's also a Memorial Sunday. There is a uh, service at the uh, Monesville Cemetery tomorrow at 10.30. Uh, for those of you that are able to make that, that would be great. Um, we have a uh, ministry, uh, Mifflin Community Food Ministry meeting this Thursday at 9 a.m. And uh, let's see, on Saturday... Uh, for those of you who signed up, and I'm just signing up today for Becky, if she's around here, yes, she's there. Uh, it, uh, that's going to be at 3 o'clock on uh, uh, Saturday at the Denver Park. And so if you're able to attend and you haven't turned in your sheet set, you might want to see Becky today because I know she needs to order everything for that. Um, greatly appreciate Dr. Ragsdale for filling in for me last week and, and for Ann Worley who uh, brought the devotion uh, last Sunday and... Uh, uh, for Donna Sewell, who ran the music for the 8 o'clock service last week. So very grateful for that, for those that filled in. It was a good uh, respite, a good time to kind of get away. I did determine one thing. I'll never, ever drive to Cincinnati again. Uh, if I go back to Cincinnati, I'm flying. <laughs> There's just no way. Uh, that uh, little area through West Virginia into the, the Columbus, uh, Cincinnati area, just is too much for me. Um, at any rate... Uh, the altar flowers are presented to the glory of God in memory of uh, Sophie Guerin by Bonnie and Denny Redkay and family. Uh, the bulletin is presented to the glory of God in memory of the men and women who gave their lives for the country by Jim, Becky, Ben, and Aaron Philippi. And yes, we, we remember those who gave their lives today. You know, we, we think about Veterans Day, we celebrate those that are living. But Memorial Day, we celebrate those that paid the ultimate price and service to their country. And so we honor their memories today. Um, our usher is uh, Glenn Worley. Our greeters are Doug and Marcia, as well as our worship leaders. And there's a list in there for pantry needs. And let's see, I think that is everything. And uh, with that, we have our preparation for worship and our call to worship. Along in your bulletin with, for, with the uh, preparation for worship. Almighty God, we pray for your blessing on the church in this place. Here may the faithful find salvation and the careless be awakened. Here may the doubting find faith and the anxious be encouraged. Here may the tempted find help and the sorrowful find comfort. Here may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. 
Here may the aged find consolation and the young be inspired through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And our call to worship is on page 798 of our hymnal. It's titled Honor and Thanksgiving. It comes from uh, Psalms 50, verse 14, 30, verse 4, 97, verse 12, 106, verse 1, 136, verses 1 through 3, and 26, uh, 105, verses 1 through 7, and also Revelation 7, verses 11 and 12. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Sing praise to the Lord, you his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Be glad in the Lord, you righteous ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Remember his wonders, which he has done, his marvels, and the judgments uttered by his mouth. He is the Lord our God. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Father God, we come together this Sunday morning to, to worship you, to honor you, to praise you, to seek guidance on our lives. We, we thank you, Father, that you have met all of our needs wonderfully in Christ Jesus. And as we worship this morning, we pray that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Give us that extra measure of your presence that we might be transformed into the image of Christ Jesus, that we might live lives that honor and please you. And so may all that we say and do be pleasing in your sight. For we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We have our memorial service of remembrance today, and uh, the bouquet of uh, carnations uh, is presented to the memory of members and friends of Zion Church who have gone <clears throat> to their eternal rest from May 2019 to May 2021. We uh, I've lost uh, some time because of the COVID pandemic last year, but we remember fondly those that have gone before us, those that have finished their course. We uh, <clears throat> remember Adele Schonauer. Timothy O'Rourke. Ryan Wood Cheeseman. Robert Miller. Margaret Yoder. Emma Davis. Gerald Oaks, Sophia Guerin, Geraldine Gerhardt, June Shirk. Beverly Hearts, Beverly. 
Eleanor Crowther. Donald Ritz. Shirley Miller. Janice Baker. Pauline Musser. And John Lord. We uh, thank God for that great cloud of witnesses that went before us, that finished their course, they sought the Lord and, and lived a life, a life that honors and pleases God. And uh, that is the goal for each and every one of us, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to avoid the things that hinder and the sin that so easily entangles, to run that race that's marked out for us so that we don't grow weary, we don't lose heart. And uh, what, what a, an amazing blessing heaven will be one day. You know, I was talking to uh, one of the pastors at National Conference about this whole uh, glory, you know, one day where there's no more sin or sorrow or suffering, no more death. And we thought about no more sin. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? That we're no longer going to be tempted by sin or challenged by sin. And instead, we will be living in the glory of God for all eternity. How marvelous will that be? And to not only be with our Savior and see him face to face, but we'll see our loved ones that have went on in faith. Our uh, opening hymn today is To God Be the Glory, number 56 in your hymnal. Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father. Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes. That moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, 
praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, the things He hath done. Amen. You may be seated. We have special music uh, by Rosalie Redkay. God bless America and let there be peace on earth. Wonderful. Thank you, Rose. I was just looking to see which foot she was using on the pedals there. So as you know, you may not know, Rosalie fractured uh, her, her bone in her ankle there on her foot. And uh, she's getting around marvelously. But thank you for that. It's very wonderful. Uh, thank, thanks to each of you who have continued to uh, support the ministries here at Zion. It has truly made a difference for us through a, a very difficult season. Uh, we're going to be talking about seasons in the message this morning, but it has been a very difficult season and one that we're still trying to, to navigate our, our way through. But through it all, you've been faithful. And so I, I thank you for all that you have done for the kingdom of God and for his church here at, at Zion and Moton. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the, the gifts, the tithes and the offerings. We pray your blessing upon the gift and the giver as we continue to lift up the name of Jesus to a world that's lost in sin, to a people in desperate need of a Savior. It's in our Savior's precious name that we pray. Amen.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and You may be seated. I'm going to reverse this a little bit. I'm actually going to do the pastoral prayer first, and then we'll do our praise hymn. Uh, so much to thank God for. I, I thank God for you know, all that he's doing in our lives, all that he is providing for us uh, through a difficult season. I, I thank God that he is meeting our needs wonderfully each and every day in Christ Jesus, that we have so much to be thankful for. I, you know, I was really had that little bird teach me a lesson yesterday morning in celebration of the gift of rain and how special it is this chirping and celebrating and dancing around as the droplets of water fell off of a bush. And that is our God who meets the needs even for the birds of the air. How much more so does he bless our lives? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, pray for those upon our prayer list and those upon our hearts and our minds that you would be with them, Father that you would meet all their needs wonderfully in Christ Jesus. We pray for Robin Lash as she continues to recover, that you would bring healing. And uh, we pray that for Nancy Geis, who's coming home today. We thank you, Father, that she's able to be back home with her family. We, we pray, Father, that you would surround us in your care as only you can. We, we thank you, Father, for those men and women that gave the ultimate sacrifice and service to this great nation in which we live. We uh, cherish their memories, we pray for their families, and we thank them for the privileges and blessings that are ours in this country. We pray, Father, for those that are in our in hospital and nursing care and for our shut-ins and for those that are, are not able to be here today. We pray, Father, that those that are suffering spiritually or financially or whatever the need may be, that you would be with them in the process, that they might seek wisdom from you, that they might come to you and lay their burdens at your feet with the realization that you are answering and providing and caring and loving in ways that we might not even begin to realize on this side of eternity. We pray for our missions and the missionaries that we support. We Pray for our military men and women throughout the world that you would protect them and provide for them. And above all, Father, continue to draw them close to you that they might know Jesus as Savior. And Lord, that's our prayer for each of us, Father. We pray for a renewal of spirit for those that have wandered away from the faith. And we pray that today might be the day that others would surrender their lives and, and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Our uh, praise him today is I surrender all. And you know, it's, a wonderful hymn, and, and yet it's one that I think so often that we, we don't really consider what we're singing. I'm reading a book now by Henry Bechtold, Are You All In? or Are You Sure That You're a Follower of Christ? And it, it really posits some amazing things. And, you know, as we look at this world that we live in, this cancel culture society that we live in that's pushing God further and further away from things, um, you know, I think that that passage is Jesus is uh, uh, assessing the churches in, in Revelation, and he says to the one church, he says, you're, you're neither hot nor cold, you're, you're just lukewarm. And, and, and it, to realize he's talking about believers, you know, that, that if you're cold and, and you don't have God at all, all right. But, you know, if you're just lukewarm, you're, you're just existing. You're, you're not living in the power of all that is yours in Christ through the Holy Spirit. And, and so we need to begin to assess our lives in light of what the Word of God says over what the culture is screaming loudly about now. And so we, we thank God. So when we, we think about I surrender all, 
Are there areas of your life that you still need to surrender to the Lord? Are there areas that, that keep you from realizing you know, all that is yours in Christ? And so as we sing that, you can ponder those thoughts. Uh, page 596 in your hymnal. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender, I surrender all. I surrender, I surrender all. To Jesus, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender, I surrender all. I surrender, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Make me Savior, holy Thy. Thy Holy Spirit fill me, may I know Thy power divine. I surrender, I surrender all, I surrender, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. To Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender, I surrender all, I surrender, I surrender all. To Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Is of our lives do we still need to open up to the purview of our Lord and Savior, as if He doesn't know already? You know, there's things that we can rationalize sometimes in our lives that. Uh, we're somehow better than others because we're not doing this or that when we're still doing things that God calls sin. And uh, we need to be very careful that we're striving to live a life every day that radiates the love and grace provision of Jesus in a world that is lost in sin, a, a dark world that's seeking to push God further and further out of the equation. You know, our, our goal is to know Christ and to make him known, Right? And the theme for National Conference this year was to know Jesus better and to love him more. And, and I like that because, you know, while we're to, to know Christ and to make him known, I, I think that should be our goal, to know him better and better to the point that people are seeing more of Jesus in us each and every day and less of the world. And, and in doing so, we, we find that we can love God even more and more each and every day. And so that is our challenge. Uh, as we begin our, our message today, and as we look at that uh, from Ecclesiastes 3, I'm going to look at the first 15 verses, and it's entitled, The Time for Everything. And there are seasons in life, right? We go through the different seasons that we see, but there, there are patterns and seasons and times and times for things that repeat themselves over and over again, and through it all, God's in control as he works out his plan for the world. Can I have somebody offer a prayer for the message this morning, please?
Mm. Amen. Thank you, Carol. I, I appreciate that. Have you ever started something and not finished it? Now, this is a rhetorical question here, but it, obviously we all have started things and not finished them. Have you ever started something and finished it, but you know you could have done a lot better with it? You know, if you're talking about a jigsaw puzzle, it probably doesn't really matter. You know, but if you're talking about the things of God and following God and, and, and being all that we can be in Christ, it's important that we are doing thoroughly and carefully all that God calls us to in Christ. You know, as far as jigsaw puzzles go, I'm ahead of the curve. I really am. I, I had a, a puzzle that said three to five years. I did it in a week. And so pretty good there, right? <laughs> Explain that to your neighbor if they didn't get it. I uh, you know, uh, it's really important, uh, probably now more so than ever, how we're living our lives. Uh, you know, our lives should be a witness each and every day for Jesus uh, in, in a sinful, lost generation. You know, when it comes to the Christian life and how we live, we need to strive to finish well this race that God has marked out for us. You know, as the writer of Hebrews 12 says, you know, fix your eyes on Jesus so you can avoid the things that hinder and the sin that so easily entangles us. And the key to finishing well the race that God lays before us is by understanding that there is a major difference uh, from simply being saved, saying a prayer, to living a God-honoring life each and every day. There's a big difference. Uh, we, we see the condition of the church in the world today, specifically in this country, as being lukewarm because so many have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. And Jesus says, a house divided will not stand. As we, we look at uh, Ecclesiastes today, we know that traditionally the books of, of, of Job and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon are all wisdom books. Uh, we know that Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. And their purpose of these wisdom books is to teach people how to make right choices about moral behavior so that they may become better images of God. You know, we bear the image of God, but are we bearing that image in, in a world where people can look at us and say, yeah, they, they, they're a follower of Christ. And as we look at a portion of Ecclesiastes today, uh, specifically Ecclesiastes 3, those first 15 verses, I wanted to let you know that in chapters 1 and 2, Solomon shares his efforts to find meaning in life. He finds that through his own efforts that pleasure, great works, and riches are simply are not satisfying, that wisdom and knowledge and joy can only come from God. And we know this is true. You know, we have more in this generation than any other generation ever had. We have more money, more toys, more things, uh, more blessings than any other generation had, and, and more than many countries have today. And yet, we're just not content. We're just not happy. I mean, you can have all the money in the world and be a miserable person because money is not going to bring you happiness. So in chapter 1, Solomon, who, who started well, but didn't finish well. He started the race well, but didn't finish well. In, in uh, chapter 1, he says, These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. He said, Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. There's nothing new under the sun. What do people get for all of their hard work under the sun? You know, generations come and generations go, and there's really nothing new. All we do is, is repackage it and do it over and over and over again. And, and so we, we have these things that are taking place in life, and everything is wearisome. It, it, it's burdensome, he says. And remember, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to you about there's two types of people in the world today, those that are followers of Christ Jesus and those who have rejected God's gift of grace through his Son. You know, those who are living for God and those that are living for the world. And the reality is for those that are living for the world, this is, this is as good as it gets. All that the world has to offer is all that they have. And at the end of the day, they're going to be disappointed. They're going to be filled with regret. The lukewarm Christian needs to be careful. 
that we don't get to the end of our journey and, and have regrets that we could have and should have and would have done a better thing if we would have kept our eyes fixed on Jesus instead of embracing the things of the world, instead of the, the giver of the things. History merely repeats itself. It's all been done before. There's nothing under the sun that's truly new. And so this brings us to Ecclesiastes 3. We're going to read the first 15 verses. And uh, Solomon says, There is a time for everything. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. I don't think that, that Solomon is promoting murder in uh, verse 3, but there are times where things die, and, and that is a part of it. You know, we have killed animals as a, a way of providing uh, for food, and uh, we, we know that there's a time for healing that takes place in our lives you know, a time to be born and a time to die and everything in between. I, I marveled at our children's birth. I was there when uh, Phyllis gave birth to our three children. And I just marveled at these little lives, these little helpless, innocent babies that, that truly were a gift from God. You know, only God can, can make this, this human life, this child that is loaned to us for a period of time. And I, I've mourned at a relative's funerals, you know, when they've passed on. I had a hard time reading my mom's name this morning. It was just hard, you know, it's, it's still fresh. It's coming up in June 16th, the anniversary of her passing. And so we, we've had these times in life, and we go through all the different things of life, and like I said, for many, that's all there is. But for us, for those that believe in Jesus as their Savior and Lord, there's so much blessing now and in the life to come one day, because God is a lot smarter than we are. God is working out all the details of life. So let's pick back up in verse 9. It says, what do people really get for all of their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful in its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's working from beginning to end. So I concluded that there is nothing better than to be happy and to enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. What is happening now has happened before and will happen in the future has happened before because God makes the same things happen over and over again. Well, it's just a different day, friends. It's the same stuff every day, just a different day. And, and life goes on as it has from the very beginning. Uh, we, we see that sin entered into the world very quickly in creation. Adam and Eve fell, and not only did sin enter into mankind, but the world around us became bearers of sin. And so sin has permeated this good world that God has created. And the problem is so many people don't understand that God is making everything beautiful in his time. He's working it out because we can't fully see and understand and comprehend the, the things that God is doing. doing. Uh, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 and 12, he says, Now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. Paul's talking about this glass darkly that we look through. And this is that beautiful passage on love. You know, you hear it just about every uh, wedding that you go to. 
And the reality is, is we cannot fully see and understand the things of God today. But God is God, creator, sustainer, and provider in the world. And he is working out all of these things. And we need to understand that we need to just to hold on. We need to keep our, our eyes fixed on Jesus. Uh, we need to strive to finish well. That's my goal in life. I just want to finish well. You know, I, I'm hoping that every year I can get a little bit better and that every day that my focus is more towards God and less towards the things of the world. And, and the world really tugs at you, doesn't it? I, I mean, if you're in the business world, you're being tugged you know, by so many different things, so many different ways. But we're bombarded with all this stimulus of the world each and every day when you turn on the television, when you, you read a book, when you watch a movie, when you interact with people in the community, you can see what it is that somebody loves can also see how disappointed so many people are at the, this lie that they've bought into that this is, this is it when they don't understand that they're looking through a glass darkly. They're not understanding that there's a God that is working out his plan, that he is making everything beautiful in his time. You know, Solomon, as you know, he asked God for wisdom above all else. He had a great start. He really did. And as we know, that, that God blessed his life abundantly, and uh, his wisdom found in Proverbs is of great value to those who trust in God. Like I said the other week, if you only had a couple of Bible books, you want Psalms and Proverbs. They're great books to read from. Read a chapter from each one every day. There's great wisdom uh, in, in, in Psalms. We can see the heart of God and the heart of man as, as man pours out his heart to a holy God asking for deliverance. And uh, the book of Ecclesiastes was written towards the end of Solomon's reign as king. And in his old age, he's taking a look, look at his life and he realized it didn't quite turn out the way that he wanted it to. I, I believe he felt sorrow. And he didn't quite finish well the race that was marked out for him, the race that he began well as a young man. And, and I've seen this uh, over and over again where believers at the end of their journey have begun to uh, contemplate things they could have done better you know, if they only had more time. You know, time is a gift from God. Each of us have a, a, allotted a certain amount of time, a time to be born and a time to die. It's what we do with everything in between that's going to make a difference. You know, Solomon even appears somewhat cynical in the opening book of, uh, of Ecclesiastes. He declares everything is meaningless. There's nothing new under the sun. I can remember doing a Bible study at Cottage Grove with this, and one of my young people said, that is not in the Bible. <laughs> I'm like, yes, it is. You know, and, and, but you've got to understand the, the, the hope that is ours in God in this, that he is working, that one day we will fully understand that right now we just need to hold on and to believe that we, we have enough of God in Christ. We have the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit of God. We have everything we need for a godly, blessed life. Solomon started well, but his finish was less than what he'd hoped for. His downfall was trading the wisdom of God for his own wisdom. You know, I often say to people, your best thinking has gotten you where you're at. You know, their, their life has imploded around them. Their, their, their life is, 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 you know, just a, a terrible existence. And they're trying to cast blame somewhere, but often the blame is here. Our best thinking sometimes is our worst enemy. Somewhere along the line, Solomon thought it might be a good idea to uh, celebrate these foreign gods and these idols that his foreign wives bowed down to. He traded in the true God for things that really aren't God at all. Proverbs in, uh, Sol uh, Solomon says in Proverbs 14, 12, he says, there is a way that seems right to a man or woman don't want you ladies to feel excluded. But in the end, it leads to death. You know, this thinking that we seem that it's okay, but in the end, it's destruction, it's death. It, it, it leaves us wishing we would have done things differently. And we need to pray for the church in America 
because I believe this is what's happening. They're, they're thinking that this is the way that is the right, right way, the right thing to do. And in the end, it's just leading people further away from God. It's having them buy into a, a lie that says you can live any way you want, and, and God's okay with that. That God's love, and those are true things, but, but God is also a jealous God. The God of judgment will judge each of us one day. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. We'll give an account of our life one day to God. See, Solomon started out believing in God and seeking God with all of his heart, but in the end, he was worshiping, worshiping foreign gods. He traded in the, the true God for the things of the world. By the whole hot and cold scenario of the church, and Jesus saying that, you know, you, you guys are lukewarm. You, you, you started out well, but somewhere along the line, you've lost your passion, you've lost your, your desire. In Solomon's old age, the women he loved turned his heart from the Lord. Solomon worshiped the very gods that the Lord commanded be purged from the land. And because of this, God pronounced judgment on Solomon, and Solomon was cut off by God by his own choice. God goes after us all of our life. I'm convinced that God does not give up on anyone. But, you know, there comes a time when God will hand us over to our evil desires. You know, you can't live apart from God for any period of time without sin strangling you, without sin pulling you so far away from God that you don't even know where you began. Fortunately, we're seeing this in the church today. One foot in, one foot out. You know, not only did Solomon's sin hurt him, but it hurt the people. You need to understand our sin has an impact on others around us. Are you all in for God? You know, to finish well with God, we need to be willing to remove from our life the people, the places, and the things that are pulling us away from God. So we have God's promise. Jesus says in Revelation 21, he tells the Apostle John, he says, I am making everything new. You and I, a, a new heaven, a, a new earth. One day we're going to wake up in glory in a glorified body and we're no longer going to be tugged at by sin. And we're going to know the truth and the whole truth and we're going to see God. We're going to see Jesus face to face. If you've lost your passion for God or if you have no passion for God, your best thinking is going to leave you wanting when you come to the end of your journey one day. Here's the thing, King Solomon's father, King David, was a man after God's heart. King David was not a perfect man. We, we know he was a sinner. We see all of the sin and the wrinkles and the failures. But what David did was he never lost his passion for God. He repented of his sin, and he constantly chased after God. And, and here's what David says in Psalm 51, 11, and 12. He says, He's talking to God. He's pleading with God. He's pouring out his heart with God. He says, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And so the question is, are you passionately seeking after God or are you just lukewarm? Are you like the world today that is being pulled further and further away from God because of the desires for the things instead of the giver of the things? See, we live in the world that God created, and he's given it to us for enjoyment. He created a good world. We, we're the ones that fouled it up. But the reality is we need to understand that after the fall of man, that this perfect, human, this perfect union with God was broken. And now mankind would labor and toil instead of simply caring for the things of God. And so many people go home from work every day and they're empty. And they, they have no joy. They have no hope other than what the world supplies because they don't have Jesus as their Savior and Lord. They don't understand that only true hope in life can come from God through his Son. Apart from that, there is no lasting hope. 
People chase after things that aren't going to last and things that aren't going to matter to the detriment of not only them, but the people that they're in contact with. You know what they say about one bad apple, don't you? You know, Solomon understood the things of God, but he simply refused to rely on God's wisdom. Instead, he sought to, to live as he saw fit. And in the end, life had lost its meaning. You know, there are a lot of people today that profess Jesus as Savior and Lord, and they're living in secret sin. And they've just rationalized that, you know what? I said a prayer, and God loves me, and I'm going to heaven without a thought to what their sin is doing to them, to those around them, and to the heart of God. You know, this is not an easy existence, you know, being a follower of Christ. It wasn't easy for Christ, was it? Well, they nailed him to a cross. They crucified the Savior of the world. All of the, the apostles, with the exception of one, were martyred for their faith in Jesus. They lived a life that was difficult, pursuing godliness because it was the right thing to do because it was the, the God thing that God had placed within them to do. And their desire was to live for God above the things of the world. Their desire was to reach and teach and grow people in Christ Jesus above everything else. Now, God knows that we, we need to have jobs and we need to do things, but you know whatever we do, we should be doing for the honor and glory of God, right? I mean, so no matter what, if you're cutting grass, you can cut grass for the glory of God. You can, you know, have a song in your heart. You can share the love of the Lord with those that God places in your pathway. So we need to learn from people like Solomon that we should not take God for granted, that there is a season in life, and you've got it, between birth and death, that's it. And you're no different than anybody else that's ever lived on planet Earth. You got good times and bad times and everything in between. And God understands that. And God has given us this time, but God is making everything beautiful in his time. You are a masterpiece. God is working on you and perfecting you and shining you in Christ Jesus. And one day you will shine a glorious life in this glorified body. And it's going to be amazing. According to Reverend Larry L. Cook, passion is the inner spark that is provided by the Holy Spirit that motivates you to live out your God-given purpose with enthusiasm. Would you describe yourself as an enthusiastic Christian? Now, you can be an introvert or an extrovert and still be enthusiastic about what you do. This is not about personality. This is about passion for Christ Jesus. Solomon would lose his standing before God he worshiped the things that God wanted him as king to remove from the land. Instead, he led people in harm's way. You know, when Solomon was living for God faithfully, this is what he, he had written. And, and it's amazing because it's the, it is the prescription for true life in Christ. It is the prescription for the godly life that will keep you on the straight and narrow, that will have you running that race that's marked out for you in Christ Jesus by fixing your eyes on Jesus. And this is what he says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So that's all I have to do, God, is get up every day and trust you with all my heart and to, to seek your wisdom above my best thinking and to start my day and go through my day and finish my day acknowledging you and, and you're going to give me a straight path. Wow, that's, that's an amazing thing. I have a, um, an app on my phone that, that monitors my weight and... Uh, it's kind of like this. Some of you can relate to it. Some of you are like that. I'm so envious of you. <laughs> uh, I'd like to be that way. But our Christian lives are like this sometimes. We're being blown back and forth by every wind of change that comes our way. And we embrace things that, that are less than wholesome, less than good or godly. What are the movies that we allow ourselves to watch or the, the language that we use or the places we go or the things we do or the company that we keep? 
So why did Solomon lose his passion for God? His thinking was different. He was no longer trusting in the Lord with all of his heart, all of his mind, all of his soul, all of his strength. He was not leaning on the understanding and knowledge in God. He was his own God. Solomon says it's better to be happy and do good while we live, that life is a gift from God that we should enjoy. And I agree with him. You know, we should be able to enjoy the fruit of our labor as we live godly lives that radiate the love of Jesus. Nothing saying we can't enjoy a good life. God's given us a good world. It's, it's not sin to enjoy the, the goodness that God's given. It's a sin to celebrate it above God. Too often, believers are celebrating the things of the world instead of the, the giver of the world. You know, biblical passion, according to Larry Cook, is created in us by God's word. That as we read the word of God, as we, we meditate on the word of God, as we live out the great commission and the great commandment and spend more time in meditating on God's holy word, the Bible, that, that it really is the impetus that we need to, to push us forward to, to be that enthusiastic uh, believer that, that loves the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. Do you want to finish well? Do you, you want to live a life that's pleasing to God? I, I believe the answer is yes. We all do. So what do we need to do uh, to, to make that a reality? Is that we need to keep our focus where it needs to be. And we need to, to stay away from that stuff that's hindering us, the sin that's entangling us. You know, I don't want to finish my life with regrets. I, I don't think you do either. I've seen people that get to the end of their life and they're miserable because they, they wish that they could go back. You only have that, the time in between, guys. That's it. And we don't know what today or tomorrow is going to bring. We just don't know. But we know that we have a creator that desires to, to live in relationship with us. He desires to be our God and for us to be his children. He, he desires for us to, to love him and to seek him and to serve him and proclaim him. You know, I, I, I can remember back to a day, as, as most of you, if you've been in the church for a while, you can remember a time when this church was packed out with people, balcony included probably, and not just Easter and Christmas. I, I can remember those days. We're really but a remnant now of what we used to be because people have decided they know what's best and they've discounted what the Word of God says. Paul says in Romans 8, verses 26 to 30, he says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. I figure since it's Trinity Sunday, we should talk about the Holy Spirit a little bit. He says, for example, when we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will, God's plan for us. That's God's desire that we live that out faithfully. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. For God knew His people in advance, and He chose them to become like His Son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him, and having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. God is making everything beautiful in his time. And I remember the story about the tapestry, the, the wording I might not have uh, completely, but it's a little boy uh, uh, sitting at his grandma's feet while she's working on this beautiful tapestry, and all he sees is all these strings hanging down underneath this thing, and he's thinking, oh, that, that doesn't look pretty at all. And she, she holds it up from the other side, and he goes, oh, wow. So often we're looking at our lives from a worldly perspective, and we're not seeing what God is doing on the other side. He has everything worked out. This is where faith comes in, to trust him, seek him, serve him, and love him. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, 
come together today and we, we thank you for your word, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path to encourage us and to correct us and to guide us and to cheer us on that we might be a reflection of the love of Jesus in a world that's lost in sin. We pray, Father, that you would continue to work out in us all that is pleasing in your sight that we could put aside those things that have hindered us in some cases for, for years, that we would begin to pray that we would uh, fall madly in love with you through your word and through your son and through prayer and through the guidance and direction of your Holy Spirit. I, I pray, Father, your rich blessing upon Zion Evangelical Congregational Church here in Moton. I pray for your church universal that there would be revival in this land, that we would see men and women, boys and girls coming to Jesus in droves. I pray, Father, that above all, that we would be faithful in handling your word with care and compassion and with conviction as we share the truth, your truth, with a world that desperately needs to hear it. It's my prayer, Father, that today, that if there are believers that have been lukewarm in their faith for some time, that today would be the day that they would rededicate their life to you, that they would fervently seek and serve you each and every day. And I pray, Father, if there are those that are with us today or those that are watching through the stream that do not know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, that today would be the day that they would invite him into their hearts to receive him as their Lord and Savior, that they might find true life and life abundant that is only ours in Christ. And so we thank you, Father, for the work begun, the work that's ongoing and the work that will be done as we travel and journey uh, on this path that you have laid out for us as we fix our eyes on Jesus. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Our uh, closing hymn today is hymn number 147, How Great Thou Art. Then 
that sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Amen. God is making everything beautiful in his time. He's making everything appropriate in his time would be another way to render that word beautiful. He's working on you and I. We need to work on ourselves to continue to seek him and serve him and love him and proclaim him in the world in which we live. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will forevermore be. Amen and amen. Amen.